this morning. We're in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, in the 8th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And we are going to be looking at the third miracle of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. Amen. And so the way uh, these miracles are divided, there's really 10 total uh, miracles, but uh, how can I say it without getting confusing to you? There's, there's, they're set up like three, and then the response of people, and Jesus' response to the people's response. Then there's three more, same thing. So there's three, 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 but within one of those, there's four. So not to confuse you, okay? So there's a total of 10, and uh, that's the, the number of divine order. And it parallels the ten signs that God did through Moses as he brought them out of Egypt. So the same God is here in this passage. Uh, before we look at verse 14, let's look back in chapter 7. Because this sets up the, the background of what is going on here. Matthew seven twenty eight came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, and that's the Sermon on the Mount, the people were astonished at his doctrine. Okay, for he taught them as one having authority, say authority, authority, and not as the scribes. So now he comes down in the 8th and ninth chapter, and he doesn't just teach with authority, but the miracles that he performs proves the authority that he has. Okay, amen. All right, verse 14, <clears throat> chapter 8. When Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, follow me, and let the dead bury the dead. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy words. We give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right. As you set down the title of the message, give Jesus a place to lay his head. Give Jesus a place to lay his head. Amen. In the 14th verse of the 8th chapter, Jesus comes into Peter's house. No doubt, he is exhausted. He has worked a miracle for a leper. He has healed the servant of the centurion. He's been ministering the word of God, so he's very, very tired. As a man, he's tired. Of course, as God, he doesn't get tired. But as a man, he was exhausted, totally exhausted. So the Bible says that he goes into Peter's house, and no doubt he's there so he can get some rest. But when he enters into Peter's house, the Bible says that Peter's mother-in-law is there. Now that's interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> because there are certain denominations that want to make Peter the first, first pope. If Peter was the first pope, then Peter was married. And so there's some scriptures uh, in the Bible that certain denominations would not want to be there. Amen. Are y'all with me here? So Peter had a mother-in-law. He was married. And the Bible says that she was living with them. She was staying with them in the house. Uh, you know, some people say the Pope is infallible. Right? Well, that means that they believe that his word is above the word of God. So there's a lot of things, uh, you know, in certain systems that are not correct. You with me here? All right. So we see that Peter, if he was the first pope, then he was a married pope. But we know that wasn't true, right? But anyway, the Bible says that he goes into Peter's house, and the Scripture says that his uh, mother-in-law, or Peter's mother-in-law, is sick with a fever. 
Now keep it in mind that Jesus is very tired at this point. He's exhausted. But he doesn't let his exhaustion stop his ministering to people. Amen. So no matter how tired he got, he always gave himself to minister to somebody else. So the Bible says he goes in and the wife of his, or the mother of his wife, very, very sick. Even though he's tired, he's going to minister to her. Now, no doubt this fever that she had was a very horrible thing. She was extremely sick. Wasn't some kind of light fever. This was a major, major illness uh, that she was going through. And so as Jesus goes into the house, again, no doubt, because he's exhausted, seeking to find some kind of rest, he ministers to Peter's mother-in-law. The Bible says that he laid his hand, or he touched her hand. Amen. Touched her hand. The Scripture says that he touched the leopard. And I don't know where he touched the leopard. Probably touched the leopard on his head. But here he touched the hand. Say, touched the hand of Peter's mother-in-law. And the Bible says, and the fever left her. The fever left her. Well, that doesn't surprise us, does it? Because he has authority to heal. He has the power to heal as God come in the flesh. So he is proving that in his ministry, he doesn't have the, only the ability to speak, but he has the ability to do the ministry. Amen. Okay, amen. So orthodoxy is teaching the word of God. Orthopraxy is practicing ministry. Now, I think either way you look at it, whether it's orthodoxy, you're teaching the Word of God, or orthopraxy, where you're ministering to the people, it's going to bring, it's going to take a lot out of you, okay? Uh, and you know that because you seek to minister to people, you pray for people, you try to win souls, and it's extremely exhausting, okay? Uh, if you've ever preached the Word of God, if you've ever ministered to people in the way of ministry, you know how, how, how hard that is. Because a lot leaves you, a lot of strength leaves you when you minister to people. So no doubt Jesus Christ is very tired, the Lord Jesus Christ is very tired, but he goes in and he still has enough strength to minister to people. Amen? Because he just, he, it doesn't matter how tired he is, how exhausted he is, he's going to find a way to minister to somebody. Amen? So he touches her, and as soon as he touches her, the Bible says, that her fever left her, and what does she do in response to that? So again, we see Jesus does a miracle. We see the person's response, and Jesus responds to uh, their response. Well, what is her response when she's healed of that sickness? Well, the Bible tells us right here. Are you all with me here? She arose and ministered unto them. Isn't that interesting? You know, if it was us, you say, okay, well, you were sick, and you've been, we know you've been healed, but go ahead and just take a break, right? Don't exhort any energy. Just go take a break. Make sure it doesn't come back on you. Make sure you don't get sick again, right? So go over there and rest a little bit and, and uh, just, just kind of recover, etc. But she knew when she got healed, Peter's mother-in-law knew when she got healed, she knew that she got healed. And so immediately after she got healed, knowing that she got healed, she got up and she started ministering to them. She showed her appreciation for what Jesus Christ did for her. Amen? You know, Brother Dice taught us a long time ago that if, as a minister, if you come across somebody and they're not thankful, let's say you do something for them. And let's just take it beyond a ministry. Let's say you do something for somebody. You help somebody. You bless them in some way. If they don't say thank you to them, they will never be thankful to God for what God does for them. And so that's always stayed with me. And I think I have a thankful spirit, but that's always stayed with me because if somebody does something for me, I want to be sure and show my appreciation Amen to them because they did not owe that to me. And the reason why a lot of people, when things are done for them, they don't ever say thank you. Do you know why they don't say thank you? Because they have a sense of entitlement. They believe that everybody owes them something. And so when somebody does something for them, they never will say thank you. Because they have that sense of entitlement. Amen. 
So I've always tried to make it a point uh, to the best of my ability. I'm sure that I've come short in some places. When somebody does something for me to always let them know how much I appreciate them and to say thank you to them. Because it's important for me to understand, number one, they didn't have to do that for me. You know, whatever it might be, to take the time to go to the store, to look for the stuff, to gather the stuff, to, you know, to buy the stuff. And then, you know, and I'm talking about gifts, of course, in this sense. But I think about not just the gift that was given, but I think about the time that the person spent. To, they took the time out of their day. They thought about me. Amen. Took the time out of their day, whatever, went to the store, gathered the stuff, put it together to say thank you, you know. And, and for me not to respond to that is to have an unthankful heart. And so whenever somebody does something for you, always show your appreciation to them. Always say thank you. And if you're a parent today, that's one of the most important things other than teaching them obedience. Your children, teach them to say thank you. Two things, say please and say thank you. Say please and say thank you. Because people don't owe you anything. You might think they do, but they don't owe you anything. And then you, listen, people don't owe me anything. And so if, if God or somebody does something for you, show your thanks. But if you can't show somebody that you can see appreciation for what they've done for you, You'll never appreciate what God did for you. Amen. And if they won't appreciate what God did for, for them, then I want you to know, brothers and sisters, it's very, it's highly unlikely that they'll ever live for God. Because you have to have a thankful heart. You have to appreciate, amen, not only what other people do, but what God does for you. You need to be a worshiper and be thankful to God. Thank God for His salvation. You know, she got up and she ministered to them. She was showing her appreciation. How much more should you and I? Been filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name. We've got eternal life. We're on our way to heaven. He saved us from the damnation of hell. And in some case, healed your body. Delivered you from addictions. Well, you name it. And for us not to be thankful to God for that, to me, is a huge sin. And so this, this mother-in-law of Peter, she wasn't like that. As soon as she got healed, boy, she showed her appreciation for what Jesus Christ uh, did for her by getting up and ministering to them immediately. She didn't go and rest, say, well, I've been sick, you know. She got up immediately and showed her appreciation. How many of y'all are appreciative today of what people do for you? How many of you are thankful for what God did for you? Amen. Praise the Lord. Because ultimately, let me just say this, not only do other people not owe you anything, but God doesn't owe you anything. God doesn't owe me anything. God doesn't owe you. He doesn't owe you to be healed, to heal you. He doesn't owe, to, owe, owe you to save you. He doesn't owe you to touch you, do a miracle. He doesn't owe you a blessing at your work, at your job. God doesn't owe you anything. He doesn't owe me anything. So the fact that he's done all of these things for me, I ought to have a thankful heart. And I ought to show my appreciation to God, not only with my words, but the way that I live. Praise God. Amen. And so this was Peter's mother-in-law. She got up immediately and showed her appreciation to Jesus Christ for what he did. Amen. So won't you just tell the Lord right now and say, thank you. When was the last time you said to the Lord, thank you? Oh, we're real good about complaining. We're real good about griping and fussing and being mad and angry and upset about everything that, you know, no, no. We need to change that and we need to be thankful, praise the Lord. Are you, are you thankful that you live in America? How would you like to live in communist China right now? And you have to go underground to serve the Lord. And if they find you, sometimes they'll persecute you. Are you thankful to be in America? Yeah. I'm thankful that I, have, I live in a free country. I can come to church free so far. They're going to eventually try to take that away from us. Okay. Amen. And come tonight, and I'll get into a little bit about that, and I'm going to show you biblically what the Bible says, uh, what is happening right now, why that's happening. It's all prophesied in the Scripture. Okay. But today we got the freedom. We can come to the house of God. 
We have freedom. Nobody's going to come so far and take us and put us in jail so far. Amen. So it'll be in a free country. We've got a lot to be thankful for. Do we realize, that, do, we, do we understand that? Do we realize how blessed we are today? You know? Do you know just about everybody that lives in America, and this is reality, just about, I didn't say everybody, but just about everybody lives better than the kings did in history. You think about it. You got running water. You got a refrigerator in your house. You can put food in and keep it nice and cool. A freezer, etc. You got refrigerated air blowing in your in your house and a heater in the winter time. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. You go to the bathroom, you flush the, the commode, and it runs out. Hallelujah! Do, do you have you ever thought about it that you as Americans live better than most kings in history live? And yet we are probably, Americans are probably some of the most unthankful, unappreciated, unappreciated people on the planet. That's so what I appreciate about Brother, brother uh, Amen, Edmonds. He's like that. He's just so thankful. And any, anything that y'all do as a church to support them in Taiwan, the mission field, always tell, tell them thank you. We appreciate Brother Carter, what they're doing, tell the church hello for us, you know. And he's always saying thankful all the time. Amen. And sometimes to the point he embarrasses me, you know, because I know how you are, how I am. I enjoy giving to them. I enjoy blessing that ministry and supporting that ministry. But he just, just like constantly saying thank you all the time. And I'm thinking, no, it's my honor. It's our honor that we get to do that. And here he's over here talking about how thankful he is, you know. Why? Because he knows that we don't have to do that. So he's appreciative. So he, I've learned a lot hanging around Brother Edmonds. Amen. I want to be thankful. Look at your neighbor and say, I want to be thankful. Are you thankful this morning? Did you come to church with a bad, in a bad mood? Did you, come to come, did you have a fight before you got to church about something you didn't have or... Are you are you happy this morning? Are you, no, maybe maybe I shouldn't put it the way. Do you have joy this morning? Okay. So praise the Lord. We ought, you know, now this is so basic, right? But teach your children to say please and to say thankful. Thank you. I pay attention to things like that. Praise the Lord, because I want to be that kind of a person. So if you're thankful to what people do for you, you'll be thankful to God. If you're not, Brother Dice taught me that, and I really pay attention to that. Let's say if we have an evangelist that comes and speaks to us, they don't ever say thank you. I, I take note of that. Brother Dice really took note of that. He wouldn't even have them back in the pulpit. If he had an evangelist that came and preached, and after uh, he preached and uh, the church had done what they could for the evangelist, if that evangelist did not say thank you to the church, he didn't have them back. You know, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So I pay attention to that kind of a stuff. Because if people don't say thank you, that means that they feel like you owe them. Hallelujah. So I, I want to be a thankful person. And so the Bible said Peter's mother-in-law was thankful. And she showed that appreciation by getting up and ministering to them, even though she had been sick. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So there's a reciprocation here. Jesus, no doubt, was tired, looking for a place to lay his head. They gave him a place to lay his head in, in Peter's mother-in-law's, or Peter's house, excuse me. And now he heals her. And now, so now, she gets up and starts ministering to him. Praise the Lord God. Amen. You can minister to Jesus. We think about the Lord ministering to us. Lord, what are you going to do for me today? Lord, I'm here, you know. And now watch this, okay. Here's another thing you watch for. The way people worship God. If they worship God with their hands like this, you watch them a lot. Okay, I'm not, I'm not being mean this morning. Not, don't have an axe to grind. But you watch charismatics. Our charismatics worship God like this. You know what they're saying? Give me, Lord. All right? You watch an apostolic Pentecostal worship God. Very rarely will you ever see them like this. They'll be like this. Why is that? 
Because they're taking the position of thanksgiving unto the Lord God. Amen. And I'm not saying that you're going to be completely, totally wrong if you do this. But I'm saying that that's the way they do it all the time. So God, what are you going to give me? Here I am, Lord. I'm ready to receive. No, God says that we should be giving back to Him. We, so we can minister to Him. So when we come to the house of God, let us don't just come to the house of God and say, Lord, what are you going to do for me today? Let us have the attitude, Lord, what can I do for you today? How can, how can I minister to you? How can I minister to the church? How can I show my appreciation for what you have done for me and throw my hands up this way instead of this way and say, give me more, Lord. Now, let us be thankful. Praise the Lord. So these are important things. I know they're real basic, but they're not taught very often today. Number one, because the parents aren't thankful. They don't teach their children to be thankful. Amen. How many of y'all are thankful this morning? You appreciate God? You appreciate each other? Do you really? That's good. And I know you do. That's true. I believe that. Y'all, this church loves each other. And and you do. You appreciate each other. Let's don't take each other for granted. Amen. It's really easy for us to take each other for granted. Our church for granted. Our families for granted, whatever, just don't do that. Let's be like this example that we see in the Word of God, Peter's mother-in-law, a person who appreciated what God did. Amen. And it's not hard to say thank you, is it? Do you all have pain in your body when you say thank you? No? Okay, good. There's some people, they have, I think they have pain in their body if they say thank you. Or if they pay anybody a compliment, it's like it's painful for them. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Let's don't be like that. Let's be like Peter's mother-in-law. Hallelujah. Because God's been good to you. And I don't know what you might be going through. Everybody going through something. Everybody does. If you're breathing, if you're a human being, you're on the planet, you're going to be going through something. You can't avoid it, right? You know how you overcome the negativity in your life? You know how you overcome the, some of the problems in your life? It's by just simply being thankful to God, you know. And look at the situation. Look at the situation and say, you know what? It looks pretty bad, but it it sure could be a lot worse. Right? And, And think about it. Look at the situation and say, okay, you know, if it was like this, it would be worse than what it is right now. Are you all awake? I mean, hallelujah. I could be in the hospital on a ventilator this morning. But I'm not. Right? Praise the Lord. You know, if I'm not careful, I gripe and complain about my allergies all the time, right? You know, life is so hard because you got allergies, you know. And, and well, at least I'm not on a ventilator this morning. I'm just saying, so sometimes you need to look at your life, and it might not be what you want it to be, but it can be a lot worse. How many of y'all believe that? It could be a lot worse. So all I know is just say, okay, Lord, I'm just going to worship you and I'm going to thank you. And don't necessarily like where it, what's happening right now, but that's okay. You're in control. So I'm going to worship and I'm going to praise you because it could be a lot worse. And if, I, if I'm not on a ventilator, I could be in prison. I, I, anybody hear that? You could be in prison this morning. Or you could be dead. Somebody got mad at you, just decided to take you out. But you're still breathing. Now, all right, let me ask you a question. I, I don't want to belabor the point here, but how many of y'all thank God for the, bre- the air that you're breathing this morning? You didn't, you didn't create the air. You thank God that you're breathing air this morning and the air that He made? You got up, took a shower maybe, and drank some water this morning. Guess what? You didn't make that water. You you think you created that water? You didn't create that water. Man, be thankful for the air you breathe. Be thankful for the water you drink. When you walked out and the sun was shining this morning, did you create the sun? 